Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Tell Your Story. I'm your host, Todd Nesloni, and each week I look to bring you a different guest who has encouraged, inspired, or challenged me in one way or another and bring them on to share some of their story in hopes that it inspires you to tell some of yours. I'm thrilled this week for my guest, Kim Taylor. On with me, Kim. Thanks for being here. Kind of tell everybody who you are. Sure. Um, it's a pleasure to be with everyone today. My name is Kim Taylor, and I am the principal at the Curran Early Childhood Education Center in Dedham, Massachusetts. Dedham is a, a small town just outside of Boston, and our school is a school of approximately 300, 3, 4, and 5-year-olds. So we have um, joy in our hearts every single day in our building with our littlest learners. We call them the littlest learners of Dedham. And I have been here, this is my third year um, at the ECEC and my 29th year in education. I was a teacher for 12 years and I'm in my 17th year of administration. So I that's- I love been, it. And, and yeah. I, I I can just imagine the fun you have at that school, but we'll get into that. But when I start these conversations, the first question I always love to jump in with is, you know, as kids, we have these dreams of what we're going to be when we grow up. So does what you dreamt as a kid align at all with what you're doing now? I would say that all my life I wanted to be a teacher. So even though I'm not technically in a classroom, I still consider myself a teacher. So in that way, Definitely. I'm still. And it was always why I wanted to be a kindergarten teacher. So when I taught the 12 years that I taught, I taught kindergarten, first and second grade. So the littlest learners have always been my um, my love and my where my heart is. Well, you know, I, I've always loved that age as well. And so, you know, I, I love that you are still with that age. Even as an administrator, you still found a way to be at a school that's just those ages. So that that's awesome too. But I've got to know, there's so many people who at some point in their career, they decide that they want to try something a little bit different in education, whether that's an instructional coach position, a administrator, a counselor, whatever it is. And so what was it for you that was kind of like that guiding point where you're like, I think I want to try something outside the classroom? Um, this is really, will sound really funny, but basically I couldn't keep my nose in my own business anymore in the classroom. And I wanted to know more about why decisions were being made and why things were happening. So that piece of it was probably the first indication to me that I needed to, you know, go out and explore other things. And I also had a principal at the time who kind of fostered that with me and saw leadership opportunity for me. So um, he was very encouraging when it comes to that. So those two things, being too nosy <laughs> and having someone see leadership potential. I love that. You know, my guest that I had on last week, Valerie Walker, she said the same thing, that that was kind of what led her into administration was the whole, I want to know what's going on. I, I have more, I, I'm so interested in what everybody else is doing and how decisions are made. So I love that you share that as well. And so, you know, what I've talked about too on here is that there's so many misconceptions about what administrators do during the day. What do you feel like after being in the position now for multiple years is, is something that is a common misconception? I would say that there is some misconception that administrators are all about data and are all about uh, curriculum and instruction and not about relationships. Um, which for me is a com is completely opposite of what I believe about administration um, and have always held relationships as one of my most important values. So I think the way I lead um, helps to lessen the administ you know, that misconception. I, I love that. And, you know, I, I I just have I have so many thoughts about being at a younger school with the youngers only. And so my first question, though, kind of stems from how has your role been affected by the pandemic this year? Because mm -hmm. I know, you know, parents have concerns about the pandemic or about their kids being in school or not being in school either way. And I can just imagine that parents of littles have even more concerns than parents of maybe high school students. And so what, how have you been handling it all? 
Well, we are very blessed here in my district that we have had um, a hybrid or fully in-person uh, model going since October. And um, our preschoolers are here full time uh, um, in person, if they're, whether they're two days, three days or five days. Um, we felt very strongly when we started planning at the district level that a, an online um, virtual environment wasn't what we believed in for I can imagine youngest. for that age. <laughs> yeah. Um, some of our kids do have like a half a day virtually on Wednesdays because there's no kids in the district on Wednesdays. So, but the preschool teachers make that developmentally appropriate for the kids. And then our pre, our kindergarten kids are here in a hybrid fashion um, or four days, depending upon their needs. So I feel really lucky that we've been able to sustain that um, since October. But there are always worries from parents when the letters go out that say we have a COVID case, yeah, you know, yeah. and your child was a close contact. So it's a lot of reassurance right. and you know again that comes back to the relationship piece that you know if people feel comfortable with you that you form the relationships with them then you can kind of hold their hand and and you know have them be relaxed and also thinking about the staff like the staff yeah. coming back in right. um all the time fully in person was about you know relationships and trust and how can we get everybody in here and feeling as comfortable as they can um, yeah. with that, whatever they come to the table with. Well, you know, hearing you talk about this stuff, one thing that comes to mind is something that I ask in every one of these conversations too. And that is, you know, especially when you're an educator, I think we struggle more with doubt than maybe some other professions. And I can imagine being an administrator at a younger campus that you deal with even more opinions of others. I know that when I was a principal, our parents of littles were very much more involved and had a lot more questions and concerns and really just wanted to make sure their child was taken care of in the best way possible. And at times I know that can eat at you as an administrator feeling like, am I doing this right? Am I good enough? Um, especially, I mean, you, when you work with the teachers too, that can sometimes come in. So how do you personally keep doubt at bay so that it doesn't take root in your own life? How appropriate is that question after we just got results from a district-wide survey about how parents have been feeling? And I think the way to look at it, and I was just telling my my PTO, my parent group last night in our meeting that you, you may have an 80% positivity rate on a specific question, but to me, I looked at what the 20% was and how, how, are those people going to have their needs met? So the 20% the of people that may not have had a positive response or um, sure, it's great for people to tell you you're doing a good job and we love that. But that 20% is what like makes you doubt sometimes like, oh, like how, how can I meet those people's needs and how but at the same time, it's like a learning curve. Like I, I use the doubt as a place to get better. Like those people are saying that for a reason. So let's look at what they're saying and not look at the extremes because there's always going to be extremes from one end to the other, you know, from one question to the other. But it makes it makes you doubt, but you have to use it for the good of what you need to get better at. You know, I love that. Um, and, you know, I think it's it's important to, for people to hear what you just said and that the fact is, you know, you're going to get some feedback that you need to take in and digest. And it doesn't mean you have to think less of yourself, but it is an opportunity to think of, well, maybe I could grow in this area. Maybe I could change some of those things up. And so I love that that's your perspective. I know for me, those surveys, even when it was like a 5% thing, I'm like, who are those one or two people? What did I do? How do I make them happy? And then my assistant principal would be like, it was one person on the survey, Todd. You can't make everybody happy. And I'm like, no, but I want to try. I want to <laughs> see if I can fix it. And sometimes right. you know, people just have a bad day and that's part of what that is too. And so I love your perspective. Well, Kim, you know, 
You and I also connected recently over a blog post that I wrote called It's Okay to Walk Away. And, you know, I shared a little bit of my story about walking away from a position that I loved with people that I loved, but it had become an environment that was quite toxic because in my a situation, it was superiors above who had made it a very it became very emotionally uh, damaging for me. And I had to reach a point where I knew that I could walk away and I wasn't uh, letting everybody down and, and that I was taking care of me. And, and that was a really hard decision for me to make, but I know you've got a, a similar story too of you taking control and realizing that what was best for you might've been walking away too. Tell me a little bit more about that. Sure. So I think um, the key pieces of that story are that um, for me, it was about values and happiness mm -hmm. versus loyalty. Yeah. Um, I had been in a district for 21 years um, as both a teacher and an administrator, and it was the district that I grew up and went to school in. So there was a lot of investment in that district for m multiple reasons. Um, and what I finally realized after um, a lot of soul searching and a lot of therapy and a lot of food issues was that I had to, it, it had to be happiness and values over loyalty. Um, I think I stayed loyal because of the connection I had to the district. Um, and I was in a position in that district where I had just started a new school. Um, so. I was like, what am I doing walking away from this? Like, I wanted this. I moved from one school to another because I wanted to start this new school community. And it was, you know, it was going really well until there was a change in leadership that made me realize that my values just didn't match. You know, it's so funny that you share that because I think the same, that was the same situation with me. It was a change in leadership that kind of, shifted things where it re I realized that things were different. But there were two things you said there that really stuck out to me. Um, and one of them specifically is you mentioned therapy. And I think that that's something that educators don't talk enough about is that that can be such a hugely beneficial thing. It doesn't make you any less or any weaker to do that. You know, was that a, a, a hard thing for you to agree to go into? Or were you like, nope, that was easy. I knew I wanted therapy and I'm so glad I did. Like, what was that journey for you? Um, I think there was a, a lot of things going on that, um, that sort of pushed me there. It wasn't like I had to make a decision. Like I was like this, my, like my, and it was all related to my eating. Like my eating is out of control, like, and, and getting to the root of why that was happening. And I knew I couldn't do it by myself. So, um, I started to investigate how I was going to do that. Um, and therapy wasn't something that I ever shied away from. Um, you know, growing up, I, I had a, a mom who was in therapy a lot. And so it wasn't a scary thing for me. Um, and realizing that you need help is actually a strength, not a weakness. Yes. Yes. And I tell my staff that, like, if you need help, come and ask. Yeah. You know, it, it, and we tell kids that, like, don't be afraid to ask a question because that shows strength. That doesn't show weakness at all in my mind. I agree. And, you know, one thing that I found in my journey is that, I, and I mentioned this a second ago, but I really struggled with walking away um, because I knew I had poured all myself into that. I loved the people I was getting to spend on a daily basis, but that love for them wasn't able to overcome some of the other issues that I was facing. And I struggled with it for a good year, year and a half, um, until there just was a breaking point where my wife sat down with me and said, I'm ready to, like, you need to do something different. You need to take care of you because now it's affecting other parts of your life too. And so how, how, how did you get to that point where you finally were like, you know what, I've got to put me first here and I've got to take care of me. I think it was the an opportunity presented itself that allowed me to um, pursue another job opportunity that was right up my alley. 
So that doesn't always happen. You don't get like slammed in the face with an opportunity to, to say, okay, here it is. This is now I can walk away. Um, and these people that I have these connections with are going to still be there after I walk away because of the relationship piece. So when I was approached about this position that I'm in now, um, I it was kind of like, you know, it was kind of like a God thing. Like, yeah. oh, like this is being presented to me for a reason. Right. You know, now it's time for me to walk away. Well, you know, um, and something that I share with people too is something that you kind of mentioned there is that when you leave, you don't have to leave the relationships. And I think one thing that I really struggled with too is this mindset. And I think so many educators find ourselves in this mindset of, but the kids need me. Like these kids, I love them. They need me. And I remember so clearly somebody who helped you make this decision came to me and said, Todd, are you really telling me that there are no other kids in this world that need you? That the only kids that exist that need you are at web. The kids need adults everywhere. It isn't just these. And just because you leave does not mean a new adult isn't going to come in and love them just as much. And I had never had somebody tell me that. And when I did it, it relieved all this stress of feeling like I was leaving these kids to nothing when I needed somebody to say, the person behind you may love them even more. And so <laughs> let it go take care of you. And I needed to hear that. And so yes. I love that you shared that piece, Kim. Well, as we wrap this up, I'd love to know, you know, one thing that I close these conversations on is the idea of, I believe as people, there are things we hold really close to our hearts and are, and are true to who we are. And so if people were to leave this entire conversation today and walk away with one thing for you, what would your one thing be for them? Um, building relationships mm -hmm. and your own personal values are two of the most important things that you can do as an administrator. I love that. Well, Kim, I have so been looking forward to this conversation and I'm really thankful that you joined me today on Tell Your Story. So thank you. Thank you so much, Todd. It was great to be here. Have a great day. And thank you everybody for joining another episode of Tell Your Story. Remember, you can check out past episodes on all the podcast stations or YouTube. I hope today's conversation with Kim has encouraged you to get out there and tell your story because every story.